groaned and said to him, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And immediately the man's ears were opened, his speech impediment was removed, and he spoke plainly. He ordered them not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them not to, the more they proclaimed it. They were exceedingly astonished, and they said, He has done all things well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The good news of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In uh, this last fall, when we began this year of faith proclaimed by Pope Benedict, then Pope Benedict XVI, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, all these terms, I'm trying to keep them all straight, I began to ask the question of what we could do as a diocese and what I would do during this year of faith. I thought about having a big event uh, like we had down at the convention center, which are really wonderful events. One here, maybe one in Monroe. But that's a lot of work. And we just did one a couple years ago, and they're expensive. And I said, well, let, let me think about this. And then I thought I would do something simple, and that is simply this. To have an evening of prayer in every church in the diocese where Sunday Mass is celebrated, to simply talk with you about faith. Most of the times I come to a parish, it's for some reason. It's for a dedication or a big event. Of course, here at the cathedral, I'm here more often. But most places I go just for an event. But this was an opportunity to come to every church and simply speak to you about what it means to be a believer. A couple of thoughts came through my mind as I was doing this. One of them is that we talk about two things with faith. The faith we believe, that is the content of our faith, we find in the catechism, and the act of faith. The act of faith. And so I began to ask myself, how, how would you know if you're living your faith? How would you know at the end of the day, that you are a believer. Now, when I was in the seminary, we had a, you know, people are always telling you, have you said your prayers today? But sometimes no one ever took the time to tell you what those prayers were. Now, my mother, she had this little prayer book with a whole bunch of holy cards in it. Each had a different prayer on it. And they were wrapped in a rubber band around it. And those were her prayers. That was her office, you might say. Her, her liturgy of the hours. She would whip, open that up during the day sometime, and she'd go through these prayer, this prayer book, saying these different prayers, novenas, and that would kind of be her prayer for the day. But they also taught us in the seminary, um, besides any personal prayer we might have, that at the end of every day we should do an examination of conscience. That is, at the end of the day, come before the Lord in prayer, wherever we are, in our bed or sitting in our rooms, and simply ask the question, first of all, where today did I experience God's grace and respond to it? That is, where were the moments in my life today that I really responded to God's grace? I avoided sin. I did a good thing for someone. And thank God for the gift of his grace in our, in our lives. And then, and you know, you're getting to this, then I would, we ask ourselves, where did I not respond to God's grace today? Where did I sin? Where did I lose my temper? Where did I cheat? Where was I more vain? Where was I proud and not humble? And ask the Lord's forgiveness for those sins. And then make a firm commitment to some action the next day that would reveal the presence of Christ in my life. 
to overcome, if I hurt someone, to say I'm sorry, or maybe do some good act the next day. Make a good act of contrition, then on the cross, go to bed. Well, I thought, well, what would be the examination of conscience, the examine for our faith? That is, at the end of the day, what would be the marks of our life that would reveal to us that we had lived that life that day as a person who truly believes in Jesus Christ and his church, truly lived their life that day as a member of the body of Christ? What would be the marks? What would be the things you would check off, you might say, to say, okay, I did this, 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 and this, and yes, now I know that I live today as a person of faith. Now, all this kind of discussion came in a certain direction for two reasons. The first one was an experience I had when I was a young priest. I'd just been ordained, maybe, well, I was ordained in June. This was my first Easter in the parish. So a good seven or eight months I had been ordained. And we were still having Mass in a cafetorium. The church was being built, so we were in a public school. Everybody was standing at the Mass. We were overcrowded. And I sneaked in the back, standing in the very back of all the standing people, preparing to go up to help with communion on the stage in the cafetorium. And this man was struggling with his young boy. He just was having all kinds of trouble. And the boy would sit down. The father would pick him up. He'd stand up and then sit down. Then, of course, he picked up the boy. And then what? The kid's his legs went limp, you know, so he couldn't even stand him up anymore. And he was getting more and more frustrated. And then he bent down. This was one of my first kind of disillusionment times as a young priest. He bent down to the and boy said, listen, behave. You only have to do this once a year. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh. I still wonder about that child, you know, whether they, they even have any kind of faith now or whether they came to become a good Catholic or any kind of Christian. Where do they find the joy of their life? The, where do they find the power of Christ in, in his life? So I thought about that. And I thought about what is, it, what is the one quality, if you had to choose one, that would really say, I have lived today a life of faith. Now, some of you have already kind of maybe come up with an answer. You think you know what it is. And I'm going to tell you what I think it is. And this is a relatively recent kind of insight on my part. But I think I would ask myself first, and there are really four points, so this is kind of tell you how far I'm going along. The first one is heavy-ended, so I've been a long time with the first one. Did I live my life today with joy? Did I live my life today with joy? joy. Now some of you are saying, oh wait, 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 that wasn't in the catechism. I don't remember. Question one was, why do I, you know, no, no, no. I don't remember joy coming in in there anywhere. In fact, I don't know if any question had joy in it. You know, maybe gifts of the Holy Spirit had joy or something, but, you know, I'm not sure if that, what what are you talking about, Father? You're sounding pretty Protestant here. What's going on here? Well, first of all, I chose joy because it really goes to the heart of of the foundational experience of our relationship with Christ. I picked joy also because in today's church, it seems like joy is getting squeezed out. Partly because we feel as though the world around us that we felt for many years maybe of our lives was kind of, okay, not exactly with us, but generally kind of with us. But it seems more and more that we can't trust the world around us to believe like we believe. Even within the church, you see people arguing, you know, those liberals and those conservatives and, you know, those charismatics and those traditionalists and all this back and forth, back and forth, arguing, defending the faith, but defending it in such a way that you don't even say the word Christ anymore. And all the joy is getting sucked out of our lives because we're afraid, because we're angry. Because we feel like we're losing something that we want to hold on to. We're not sure about all that. And so joy is getting squeezed out of our life. And we need to recover the fact 
that if we are ever going to be true witnesses of the gospel, effective evangelizers, then we need to know that the first experience of encounter with the Lord should ultimately be joy. Joy that we have discovered that our God loves us so much that he gave his life for us and continues to give his life to us on this altar. That he loves us so much that he forgives our sins and that he has saved us from death itself and offered to us the hope of eternal life. And he offers to us the words, the teachings, the example of everlasting life. That first moment of encounter with the Lord should be one that fills us with joy. A joy that reminds us that we are not alone. A phrase from Mother Teresa I have still on my, the glass broke, but I still have it on my wall. Let nothing ever so fill you with sorrow that you forget the joy of Christ risen. It is the light that dispels the darkness of our hearts. And so we should be people that act with joy. And if we act first with that joy of that encounter with the Lord, it will flavor everything else we do as followers of Jesus Christ. Tonight I'm going to talk about being Catholic, about being disciples, disciples of Christ, followers of the Lord. All those things are our words. They're, don't worry about it. Don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying we're not Catholic, we're all just only Christian. Those are, claim our word. Those are our words. Now, when I say disciples of Christ, I'm, I'm not referring to the disciples of Christ church over there, okay? But specific about all of us being disciples of Christ. That when we feel, when we get hold of that, there should be a joy in our heart. And if, if we start there, then everything else gets colored in a different way. We're not defending as much as we're proclaiming. We're not fearful as much as we are hopeful. We're not so concerned about getting in our way as we are patient and able to wait, trusting in the Lord. And we can almost, if we can recapture it, take a deep breath oh, and just relax and find that our faith is not a burden, but a joy. An invitation. It is. Our faith is an invitation from the Lord. And to understand it is that we have to understand that the Lord loves us. A few Months ago, I did a graveside service, and this man, uh, his favorite passage was the, the reading um, about love is kind, love is gentle, love is, you know. Now, I'm a little facetious about that because I've read it so many times at weddings, you know, and everyone's so all dreamy-eyed, you know, that I, I kind of, you know, I, I shouldn't say that, but I, I'm a little facetious about it, you know. And, but I never read towards the, they usually cut it off, but if you go towards the end, it says, of course, now I see through a glass darkly. I can't really see God. I can, see, I can kind of see God, but not completely yet. But then, when I meet him face to face, then I will see him, and I will see how I have been seen, how I have been loved. So it's not just a matter of us coming before God, and now, oh, we see God. No, we see ourselves through God's eyes. We see how we have been loved, how we have been known. And I think this is a good thing to open up in our hearts, if we, in our prayer, is to kind of say, Lord, to kind of imagine, what does, how does the Lord see me? How does he love me? What sums up his great wish for me? His desire for me? Even a few months ago further, I was reading, I used to love to read Pope Benedict because he would surprise you. You would think... He would be kind of boring, you know, or kind of, they call him a theologian. But he was so pastoral in his writings. And I'm reading this, this, it's a sermon he wrote for a Sunday, and he said, today, Jesus sums, the, the gospel sums up all of Jesus' mission, Jesus' teaching in one word. And I didn't read the second line, I said, oh, I know what it was, it was love, it's love. And it wasn't, he said, no, the word is, ephatha, be open. 
That, I think, is the Lord's deepest desire for us, to be open, to be free. Not free to do whatever we want, but free to be able to love as he calls us to love. That's his great example. That is great invitation to us. I want you to be free. Let go of that fear. Let go of that anger. Let go of that self-loathing. Let go of that guilt that, that you refuse to give over to me. Let go of that pride, that vanity, that fear of aging. Whatever it is, let go of it so you can be free to love as I call you to love, as I invite you to love. And when God looks at us, that's what he sees in us, that capacity. And he wants us to be open. And again, it's a freeing thing, not a binding thing. Religion, word means bind, but we think of religion as not binding us up, but binding us back to God, connecting us back to our roots, you might say, to the foundation, for we are made in the image and likeness of God. Now, it's not easy to keep, sometimes we lose that joy, or that joy is sometimes hard to find. You might say, wait a minute, I'm not sure I ever had that joy. It's possible Because sometimes we approach our faith simply as, well, like that little child's father. Have to. This is what the rules say. This is what I have to do. Okay, I'm going to do it. So it becomes obligation. It becomes memorization, doctrine, all of which is important. But, as the gospel says, without love, it's nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's not just about what we know about our faith. It's about the act of believing. And so if we've never found that joy or we've lost it, then the first thing we need to do is pray for it. Pray for the grace of that joy of knowing that we are saved. The joy of the encounter. Sometimes people will lump the Christians, the Jews, and the Muslims together and say they're all people of the book because we all have a scripture's. But we are not just people of the book. We are people of the Word. The Word of God. Yes, in the Scriptures, but more than that. In the Word. And we need to come to know that our faith is not in something, but in someone. And find the joy of that encounter. Because if we don't find that joy, everything else is going to be a burden. And we're going to pick and choose what we want. When we're motivated by love, we'll do so much more. I always use the example, I've been using the example of a teenage boy. I hope there's not any teenage boys here, so um, I don't want to pick on them, but if your mother or father asked you to go mow the lawn when you were a teenager boy, oh, Lord, it looks like a big drama. You know, oh, no, I got, I got homework to do, you know, or I don't want to do that. Or, and then finally you get outside, and, it won't start, it won't start, you know, there's no gas. There's a gas can, oh, where? I don't see it, you know. You know, oh, the t- its lid's too tight, you know. But if you get a call on the phone from his girlfriend who says, hey, John, my mom's asked me to mow the lawn. Could you come over? Bam! He is gone. He is over there in a minute. He is mowing that lawn. He is raking that lawn. He is edging that lawn. He is doing everything he can do. Why? Because of love. We must find the gift of faith the gift of God's love before we'll ever really embrace the challenge of the gospel. But then once we have the love of God, the challenge becomes not challenge at all. That's why St. Paul says, for the person of faith, there is no law. Why? Because the person's already so far beyond the law that it doesn't make any difference to them. They don't worry about stealing because they're so busy giving away what they have. So if we're going to find joy, first of all, we need to pray for it and find it in that encounter with the Lord. We can lose joy also because the gospel and our personal desire in life come at odds. And usually the problem is is that we have not opened up our heart big enough to receive the full invitation of Jesus to follow him. And so... We don't want to give of ourselves to something. 
we, we're giving too much time. That's going to be demanding. I've given too much already. I can't give any more. This is restricting. This is suffocating me. And usually the problem is not because the commitment or the vow or the, is wrong. It's because we're having trouble letting go of all of our hopes and dreams and things that we thought might be happening or would be happening. And we don't want to embrace the call, the vocation, the invitation to love. The answer to that is oftentimes to follow what Jesus says, that we must die to ourself, let go of that stuff, so that we might embrace the cross, come and follow him. I use the example, I've used it before, but of a young mother or father who somewhere in the middle of their life becomes very frustrated, angry at everything. Everything's very frustrating to them. Why are you doing that? And if they take time, sometimes, this is not always, but sometimes they find that they're realizing that all those things they had hoped they would accomplish, all those places they hoped they would go, backpacking through Europe or all those things they had dreamed one day they would do, it's just not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not while they're married or this or that or got this responsibility with their parents. and It's just not going to happen. And they're just mad. They're mad. And they're sad. And so what's the answer? Leave everything and go backpack in Europe? Or the invitation of God to love is that no, I have to realize that's past. And when the person, if a person is able to let go of those things that are not real, they're only imagined goals or imagined hopes, if those were able to let be let go of, then we become free to embrace the good thing that's right in front of us. And so oftentimes we'll lose our joy when we become in conflict with the gospel. Jesus calls us to love a little more. We don't want to love a little more. And oftentimes we find our joy not by running away from the Lord, but by picking up our cross and following him. And it's hard. It means grieving for what we've lost. It means struggle. It means difficult choices. But often, sometimes, we find the joy by opening our capacity to love in a different way. But we can only do that by letting go. I tell I had my schedule one time was so filled, and I went to my spiritual director, and he said, now, what happens if someone today comes and, and says they want you to add something to your calendar? I said, well, I'll just add it in. I said, well, isn't that the space where you said you were going to pray? Yeah, well, I'll pray somewhere else. Where, where are you going to put it? You can't put something in your life without taking something out. Same thing, you can't embrace something more fully without letting go of something. Same thing can happen if you're carrying a wound around with you. Because sin can also steal the joy of our heart. Remember a story, I, this, this young girl stays with me all the time. She came and she sat down and she said, I haven't been to church in six months. Of course, the fact that she's telling me this means she wants to talk about it, okay? Otherwise she wouldn't tell me about it. And so I had a question I used to ask that usually proved to be pretty valuable. I said, what happened six months ago? Well, now we were at the heart of the matter, and she confessed that she did something that was, she was really almost surprised that she did it. It was a sin, and she felt it as a sin. And there were two reasons why she didn't come to church. Number one, as she began to come into the church after that, she began to feel as though God was judging her, calling her a sinner, telling her she wasn't worthy to be there. Of course, that wasn't coming from God, it was coming from her, but she couldn't stand it anymore. Or she'd come into church and she would feel God's love for her and she felt unworthy. How can you love me? It's amazing how many people I meet that carry around the sin in their lives for years, bearing the burden, letting it keep them disconnected from God in some deep, fundamental way. And when they take advantage of the sacrament of reconciliation and they speak that sin into the light, because sin likes the darkness, and the darkness strangles our joy. But when we bring that sin into the light, we discover two things. First of all, 
we gave it far more power than it deserved. As it turned around in our mind and our heart, it just took on more and more weight, more and more clouded our minds and our hearts, more and more made us feel unworthy, unloved, unworthy of love. But when we speak it out into the light and say it out loud, and we know another person is listening, even if we're behind the screen, we can say this into ourselves and we can make it sound really good. But if we say it out loud and from another person, we, it kind of just hangs out there. It's this big, horrible thing that we can't change. But then, in the light of God's love, it disappears. And then we hear from the priest words of forgiveness, love, acceptance. And we think to ourselves, why did I carry it so long? Sin can suck the joy out of us as well. And we can carry bitterness in our lives for a long time. And you might say to me, you know, well, I can't forgive. Well, then you will never find the full joy that God wants you to have. You will never be free to love as he calls us to love. And you must die to that in your life. Let it go. And you won't come out even. You may even lose a bunch of stuff. But why carry it with you anymore? Jesus wants us to be open and free. We need to find that joy that is the, the, you know, the joy of our youth. The, the psalmist calls it the joy of our youth. It gives us a kind of new energy, a new hope. Because joy that comes from our faith is a kind of mixture of, of, of hope and faith. A trust. A trust the Lord's with us and a hope for the future. If we carry that in our heart, we have the gift that gives meaning to our lives. And once we, we act out of that joy, it all just comes out different. We're not the mean old, you know, holy person, you know, that will yell at you for all the sins you committed. We become the person that mirrors the joy and the love of Christ. It doesn't turn its back on sin, knows what it is, but also knows the love and forgiveness of God is always greater. So if you have joy, the next thing, what do you look for? Did I have joy in my life? Then another thing, did I live my life today as a disciple? That is, did this encounter with Christ become so meaningful to me that now it makes a difference in the way I make decisions in life? That I choose things in light of that faith, in light of my eternal glory, in light of what God wants me to do to be open. You know, do, do I do it? Now, it doesn't always have to be elegant. I, I've said this many times, but I think it's an important thing. It doesn't have to be elegant, okay? You can hem and haw and yell and scream and, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, I always refer to the husband and wife in the middle of the night when the baby's crying, you know, who's going to get up? And I've used this example before, but there can be a lot of yelling back and forth. I know you're really asleep. You're not asleep. You're awake. You can hear the baby. You get up. No, you get up. You know, I did that last time. Oh, my, my little leg, cramping my leg. Cranky leg's cramping up. I can't do it, you know. It can be all this arguing. But in the end, what happens? Someone gets up. One of the gospel readings says, one person, the master says, go and do this. The person says, yes, but he doesn't do it. He asks another servant, no, I'm not going to do it. But he goes and does it. Which one did the will of the God? Will of the master. Well, of course, the one that did it. Doesn't have to be elegant. Doesn't have to look pretty. But it's about being faithful. That is, living the gospel, living that encounter with the Lord in a way that, that it changes our decisions. And I've mentioned it here once in this church. It means going to the deepest part of our being where we make decisions and asking ourselves, in that moment, am I saying, what do I think is best for me? Or in the, in the deepest part of who I am, is there a conversation going on? Do I encounter the Lord and say, Lord, what do you call me to do? For you have the words of everlasting life. How can in this moment I be more free to embrace the life that you call me to? At the heart of our being, are we alone or are we together? And if we struggle with that, and it's not easy to do that, we don't always get it right, we don't always say joyfully, yes, Lord, Sometimes we sin, sometimes we turn away. Sometimes it takes us a while to open up. But if we struggle with that, 
then the next thing we do is we begin to give in our life what I call a compassionate witness. Because if we're living the gospel and we're making decisions in our life in a public, in a real way, then people begin to see it. When they see it, they don't see someone that's going around shoving it in their face, but they see someone who gives a compassionate witness because they know it's not easy. They know at times it's hard. And so they're always well willing to work with people, be patient with others. Be accepting of the sinner, for they know they are a sinner too. And know that God forgave them and he wants to extend his love to them. And so we become compassionate witnesses of the gospel. And when we have become compassionate witness, and this is number four, then we become evangelizers. Because ultimately someone's going to come up and say, why are you doing it this way? Why are you forgiving them? Why are you so nice to that person? Why didn't you yell? How, why were you able to forgive them? And then you can say, because. And then you give witness to your faith. And it's that witness that begins to evangelize. And so at the end of the night, when you come down and you ask yourself, did I live a life of faith today? You say, did I live a life of joy? If I didn't find joy, did I seek joy in my life? Did I live as a disciple of the Lord in my decisions? Was that able to be seen in my life? Did I give witness to Christ? And if there was an opportunity to vocally, in some real way, profess my faith in Jesus Christ, was I willing to do it? Not to convert, but simply to give witness to Christ. How do the early church, people around the early church, they looked at the Christians and they they say, see how they loved one another. And that drew people to them. And so tonight as you go to bed, ask yourself those questions. Find the joy. Doesn't mean, and I want you to see this, what I'm asking actually is more. I'm asking more than just standing up and professing our faith. Well, you know, in this day and age, you've got to stand up and profess the faith. You've got to fight for the faith. And I, I agree with you 100%. We've got to stand up and witness the faith. But it's not about just saying the words. It's about having hearts filled with love for the people we're proclaiming the truth to. Anyone that stands out and witnesses an abortion clinic is not condemning the women going in. They are witnessing the love of Christ that invites them to make a different choice, invites them to come to know the joy of the Lord, even in this difficult moment, to offer hope where maybe hope has been lost, to offer forgiveness where forgiveness is felt is unworthy or a person is unworthy of. It's a witness that's powerful but rooted in love. And so if we discover the joy in our heart, you see, it changes everything. It doesn't make us less, you know, you might say, strong in our witness, but it changes the way we give witness. And I think it's a witness then that attracts people, speaks to their hearts. So today, let us continue, let us this day thank God for the gift of our faith, the gift to believe in Jesus, the word, And let us be the body of Christ in the world today, giving witness to Christ's love. Let us find the joy of our heart. Let us let that joy change the way we live. Let the way we live give witness to Christ in the world. And through our actions, may others be drawn to Christ to hear us give witness to his presence in our life. One last story. I I did a priest retreat for the with a priest of Houston. And one of the priests afterwards says he was going to do a, had a difficult wedding right now. He said there was a family, a very strong Catholic family. Of course, the more he talked about this family, I thought, oh God, that, they sound like they're more Catholic than the Pope. I, well, I wasn't sure. I mean, they had they were a very strict family. And this girl was marrying a Protestant. In fact, she had joined an evangelical Bible church. And she came to the priest. Of course, the parents say, you go talk to the priest. So she took her boyfriend, who was uh, Baptist or whatever, whatever the church was, 
And they went and talked to him. And she said, you know, I, I just feel free now. I feel free because I don't have all these rules. I don't have all these obligations. I just know God loves me. And for the first time in my life, I feel free. And I can understand that some people can get the wrong message. And maybe sometimes we preach the wrong message. But I told that priest, you know, there's a lot going on in there. There's a lot going on, family and otherwise. But I said, what you need to realize and what we need to realize, that those are our words too. That we pray and believe that we have a God who wants to free us. To be open. To love as he calls us to love. Now if you think that's a simpler message and maybe too, you know, mamby-pamby, you know, not a really strong message, then begin the walk that way. And you'll find very quickly that it's a much more demanding gospel. But it's one that's more rewarding. Because it really begins to change our hearts. So let us pray that God gives us that grace, that faith, so that we can be open and find the joy of our youth.